Well, good morning, people of God. Greetings in Jesus' name. We're so thankful that God is uh, reigning on his throne and that we can be confident today. It doesn't matter. It like Chicken Little. If it feels like the sky is falling, God owns the sky. Can I get an amen? He owns the sky. And um, I want to turn your attention today at uh, 1 Samuel 15, 29. Um, a reminder of the God that we're dealing with. First uh, Samuel fifteen twenty nine, and it says um, as we open up for our time of worship before we begin to um, to uh, respond to him in worship, um, it says he who is the glory of Israel. Everybody say the glory of Israel. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. This first song we're going to begin with is that God is a man of His word. And um, and a God of his word. He's the one who sets the standard. And in, in a culture where uh, anybody can kind of say anything or uh, let me vent, get this off my chest or post this or tweet this. God, he does, is not like man that he should change his mind. So we are going towards and, and responding and worshiping a God today that we can take at his word. Amen. He doesn't say things and then he's like, oh, never mind that. He is a man and a God of his word. And so um, as we uh, begin with our worship time, wherever you're at, and we got the uh, people standing together as we gather today, let's stand up and worship God today. Wherever you're at, if you're online, at home, as we gather here with, um, with the body as well too, we are going to give our allegiance to the one who is not fickle. Father, we come before you today. We thank you that you are not man, that you should lie. Or, or, or a man that you should change your mind. You are a God who holds you to your word. And we thank you, God, that we can then be people of your word, trusting in your promises. <laughs> when our emotions fail us and our heart begins to feel even numb because it feels like challenge just continues to endure, I don't know how much more pressure I can take. I fa thank you, Father, for coming to rescue us and for being a, uh, being a God of your word. So we look to you today, holding on to your promises, and we choose to worship, we choose to celebrate the God who sees, El Rioy, the God who sees. You counted our hairs again this morning. We are valuable in your sight. And so we look to you today, and we will be people that hold on to your promises, and we will worship, not even for uh, what we are experiencing, but because of who you are. In Jesus' name, be glorified as we respond to you. In your precious son's name we pray. And everybody said, amen. You might have to put your hands together this morning. are possible, say, all things are possible, when we believe, all chains are breakable, when we receive in Yahweh, you keep your promise. come on, say it, if you said it, if you said it, we believe it, if you said it, if you said it, we believe it. Confidence, you'll feel. 
finish, you'll finish what you started. God, you have never failed, and you won't start with me. Present in every step, patient in every heart. God, you will never come on, you will not. You won't start with me. We have this confidence. We have this confidence. You'll finish what you started. Your heart and leave it in your love. 
even than our world that's crumbling around us. Oaks of righteousness, says the Lord. Oaks of righteousness, says the Lord. You'll be transplanted by streams of water. You'll be different. He wants us to be different. Invite us and us to be different. Can we say it one more time? I will build. So I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be said, why do you worry about what all these other people worry? What you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. He said, just seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these other things will be added to as well. It's the time for the people of God to put the words of Jesus into practice. Let's take him at his word and see how we see his hand in our lives. Lord, can you lead us before I bring my name?
body together. Can we say it together to keep him firm? All across the city and together live we say firm. Oh Jesus, we don't want to have hearts that are divided. Would you make us better than we could be by ourselves? Pray that we would be known as far as heaven is concerned of worshipers who sought you first. That we wouldn't have any other idols in our life. Even if fear or anxiety is an idol, it would be eclipsed by the wonder of Jesus. We commit to you our hearts again. In the great name of Jesus, we all pray. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning and welcome. Here it is a beautiful day that the Lord has given us, and it is so great that we can come together as a church community and worship and praise together. So thank you for being a part of this, whether you're online or here in person. Uh, it's good to be together and uh, to be worshiping like this. If you go online, you can find the connection card there. This used to be this handy little card that we would have in person. We've gone to just the online connection card. You can uh, put information there about how the church, elders and staff can be praying for you, holding you up, praising alongside you, uh, wherever you're at. If you have not been receiving information from, from the church, uh, just regular communication, you can also use that uh, to update and find ways the church can connect you, whether it be a physical address or an email address, uh, to keep that moving on. You can also use that for God sightings. Where is God moving in your life? Uh, there are times right now where people are really down, really sad, but also times where we can see that the Lord is moving in a great way. So let's share those and encourage others in all that we have going on with us. So use that connection card just for the simple things, but also for the great things that are happening. And while you're online, you can also use the giving, give now portion of that to keep supporting this church financially. And if you are in person, there are offering boxes in the back of the buildings, but also during outdoor services right there. So there's plenty available online to take advantage of. If you are in interested in an indoor service, we have an 8.30 indoor service here at Maple, but also at 10.30 at the Palm site. So we have two different indoor services at two different times, and also the outdoor service at Maple at 10.30. So there will always be uh, the online version, so we have a lot of options for you of how you can be a part of this and communicate and worship with what's happening. Our outdoor Sunday night live services will begin again next Sunday. So the 28th, you can expect to be a part of an outdoor Sunday evening, Sunday night live service uh, to do that. Tonight, there will be a unique service of open prayer. So Kent and Ron will be leading that if you'd like to be a part of an open prayer time. That's from 6 o'clock to 7.15 at the Maple site, uh, outdoor under the tent. Uh, and if that's not enough of all that's going on around here, we also have uh, the Marriage Works uh, ministry is starting up this Tuesday night. If you'd like to be a part of that six-week communication study, you can uh, sign up for that. There's still room. Men in Action starts on the 1st. That's next week. So if you are interested uh, in Men in Action, maybe you want to do it for the first time or bring a buddy and do it a second time, that's the beginning. And also next week, Financial Peace University begins. So in the midst of uh, the uncertainty, we still have some strong ministries that you can be a part of. We'd love to see you be a part of that. Wherever God moves you and puts you in, take advantage of the time with other believers, with other humans, uh, and interacting with them whenever possible. So thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. And uh, with that, I'd like to spend some time just giving this time back to the Lord. If you'd bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy that we can look to you as being first uh, knowing that we can humbly come behind you and that you are guiding us and you are leading us. I thank you that uh, as I come before you empty-handed, as we come before you empty-handed, you fill us uh, so that we can be poured out in service for you. Help us to always remember that you are our guide, that you are our strength, and you are the one who provides. We give you this today and all this before us, Lord. Amen. Amen. It's a beautiful new song reminding our souls. Sometimes... We, uh, we need God to awake us. The psalmist would often say, um, bless the Lord, O my soul. It's interesting. He wasn't schizophrenic, but, um, he wasn't, uh, but sometimes you have to remind yourself, come on, hey, 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 wake up. Everybody, ha anybody had those moments when you're feeling like, I just, I need to push myself to get in the right position because my emotions aren't feeling it, right? There's something beautiful about um, saying, bless the Lord, O my soul. I want you all to say that together. Say, bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. 
and the Bible says, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. This is awake my soul. And we pray God would continue to wake us in these important days. church. It is great to have you with us here this morning, and even for those of who are joining us online, it is great to have you with us today as well. And so I invite you to take your Bibles, if you have them with you, opening up to 2 Timothy chapter 4, 
verses 19 to 22. The last few verses of this particular message, this, this book of the Bible, 2 Timothy. And I, as I was thinking about these verses over the course of the last several weeks, I was reminded that as I was preaching some of the verses before this, I actually had some meaty verses. But the verses we're going to look at today don't feel as meaty because they're really just names. Names of people, names of people maybe that you don't even know anything about. People that you've never heard about, people that the Bible really doesn't speak many things about. And so as I was thinking about this, I was just really thoughtful of the fact that, that heaven is filled with lesser known saints. Lesser known saints. And so that's the title of the message today, Lesser Known Saints. And the main theme that I want us to take away is that you are a supernatural fruit-bearing child of God. You are a supernatural, fruit-bearing child of God, but there might be times in which you don't really feel like that. I want us to even be reminded that there are so many people given names in Scripture, but we know nothing about, and yet God knows their names. God is reminded of them. God knows them. He knows everything that they have done. And one thing that also I want us to take away from this message today is that even though there are many names that are written down in the Bible, what matters most is whether or not your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's where we're going with this message. There are lots of lesser known saints here in this world. And I'm reminded of somebody even that's very familiar to our family. We refer to her as Nai Nai. Not a relative of our family, just someone that we actually know very well. She was born in a different country, a country that really is not a, a popular country. And she is a single woman. She was saved as an adult, and she was really just convicted about what she would do with her life. She decided to go to China and start opening up orphanages. She had never been to China before. She didn't speak Chinese. She didn't know anybody. She didn't have any money. She just felt that this is what God would have her to do. This is her ministry. And so she moved to China and just began trying to reach out to people, learning the, the language. She actually did open up an orphanage. She opened up nearly about 10. She worked with a lot of different special needs children over the course of a, a number of years. And send it was something like 100 or so orphans that came into her special needs orphanage were adopted out into the, into the world. And she did this purely by no donations of people who would give. And that would be amazing enough, and I refer to her as Nai Nai for a particular reason, not giving you her name, because not only did she do that, but she also was a part of a lot of underground churches that, that she worked with and started there in China. Then even had a ministry of smuggling in Bibles. And the thing is that even while she was there, nobody around her community knew her name. They didn't know anything about her ministry. She wasn't important to them. But so many of us around the world were praying for her and praying for that ministry. And God used her in amazing and marvelous ways. And sometimes when I, when I think about her, as I met her, I, I went, went to China and met her, I remember thinking I am sitting, in, in, I'm sitting with Christian royalty. Someone who is used so faithfully by God. Nai Nai. But God knows her name. I was reminded of her and several others, even with regards to the parable of the talents. Remember that parable? Somebody was given five talents and went and invested and got five more. Someone was given two and invested and got two more. And then one received one talent, buried it in the ground. That person was an unbeliever. I want you not to even think about the five talents. I want you just to think about the person who is the two talents. Because that's really kind of the focus of the message today. But, but the talent in that parable, it doesn't refer to, it doesn't refer to something you do. Talent is a, is a weight of measure. It speaks about opportunity for service. 
One of the things that you learn from that parable is that God rewards faithfulness. He doesn't reward based upon the final outcome. God rewards our faithfulness. God rewards your diligence in ministry. And for those of even who, who are actually diligent in ministry, who take the two talents and actually go and, and use those in marvelous and wonderful ways with wisdom, God will provide even more opportunity to influence people for the kingdom of heaven. And one of the nice things about the, the two talents is that person who went and invested and received even two more, they received the exact same blessing, listen to me, word for word, the exact same blessing as the one who had the five talents. There is no difference in regards to God's eyes about what sort of opportunity a person receives. It's what we do with it. And I think about Nainai who, who was saved as an adult, and she didn't know what to do, there's a sense in which she went out and made her opportunity. Sometimes God opens a wide door for you, and he just allows you to have this tremendous ministry, but sometimes you got to go and look for it if the door of opportunity doesn't swing wide open right in front of you. As I was thinking about this parable of the talents, it even says in Matthew 25, verse 14, for it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gave five, gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who had received the one talent went away and dug in a hole and put it in the ground and hid his master's money." And then as you skip down a few more verses, after the blessing was given to the one who had the five, it also says to the one who had the two, and the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And so in that parable, you know what, you know what that, that slave, that servant says? Is, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. What are the talents God has given to you? What has he entrusted you with? And what are we doing with them? As I think about the lesser known saints, as I think about those who, who fill heaven I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the very beginning of that letter, verse 26, it says, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. You know what God does? Is God works with the lesser known saints to do amazing things in the kingdom of heaven. And so our text for today, these final few verses in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 19 to 22, I'm going to read these, and it doesn't feel like there's a lot of meat there. And yet at the same time, it is inspired scripture. And God has these names there for a reason. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, but Trophimus I left sick at Miletus. Make every effort to come before winter. Eubulus greets you. Also Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. And so we're going to see four things here in this passage. And for our message this morning. We're going to see very quickly just a review of 2 Timothy. And then we're going to get into the verses in the second point, And it's faithful then forgotten. And that's the crux of it. That we are to be faithful with the ministry, with the time that God has given to us, and then we are to be forgotten. Because the ministry is not about us, it's not about you, it's not about me, it's not about our reputation, it's about God. And so we are faithful with the time and then forgotten. 
We're going to see some examples of lesser known saints and then be reminded that God knows your name. And so as we begin with the re review of 2 Timothy, I wanted just to highlight a couple of things just to remind you, even to set the, the tone of some of the main points and commands of 2 Timothy up to this point. In chapter 1, verse 6, the Apostle Paul, who was in a jail, writing to Timothy, Timothy who was pastoring the church in Ephesus, who was doing a great job in regards to pastoral ministry, but just wasn't really giving it his all, Paul wrote to him to remind him of a few things, and the first thing that he says is something that I need to be reminded of, and maybe you need to be reminded of as well. I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God which is in you. We need to be reminded to kindle afresh the gift of God. In chapter 1, verse 14, he says, Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. That's that same word that was used in the parable of the talents. Where, Master, you have entrusted two talents to me, and I have gone and made two more. And so he says to Timothy, Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. He then says in chapter 2, verse 3, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 1, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. In chapter 3, verse 12, indeed, all, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. As he begins to conclude the book, in chapter 4, verse 5, he tells Timothy, but you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, and then here it is, fulfill your ministry. And then one last one in chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. And as I'm thinking about 2 Timothy, there are a few takeaways that I gather from this book. The first one is that ministry is difficult and challenging and excited, exciting. Ministry is difficult, challenging, and exciting, but most people don't think about it that way. Most people, uh, like me even at times, oh, it's, it's Monday, and you got to start and do it again. Life is like that, but life is ministry. It is difficult. It is challenging. It is exciting. The second thing is that we are all called to ministry and to serve those who are around us. The third is that Scripture is our greatest tool and our most blessed weapon. It's not as though God simply said to you, go and get involved in ministry, and I hope you get it figured out. Go and, and use your own strength. Use your own ingenuity. No, he gives you the Word of God. He gives you the greatest and most blessed weapon that we have in which to fulfill the ministry that God has given to us. And the fourth, God rewards his people based on diligence and obedience. Not on the outcome, not on the result, because the result is his. He rewards based on diligence and obedience. The fifth one is that the world may be against you, but God is what? God is for you. Six, never give up. Never give up. There is always more. To be done. And so with that as an introduction, as we dive into these, these names given to us in verses 19 through 22, we come to this point, faithful then forgotten. And there have been times in which I've been speaking at different churches over the course of years, and I will ask people, for example, to think about if you, knew, if you know your great-grandfather. Do you know the name of your great-grandfather? Do you know the name of your great-great-great-grandmother? You don't even many times know the name of our ancestors just a few generations removed, let alone we've never met them. Very often, even in our, our own ancestral tree, we forget them. They are forgotten, but God knows all things. And even in the ancestral tree of Christianity, there are many people, many saints who have gone before us, many people, many saints who have ministered and served in this church over the course of the last 50 years that I will never know, that I have never met, maybe that I even have passed on since I have come, and yet God used them in amazing ways. Faithful then forgotten, but God remembers. 
This last week, a few pastors and, and a staff member, we went to the Fresno Rescue Mission as an opportunity in which to serve and to learn a little bit more about the ministry there. And so there was about six of us, and we went. And I have served in the Fresno Rescue Mission in the past. Wonderful ministry. They believe in, now they just call it Fresno Mission. But we got a chance to go through and tour the facilities. And we went back into one of the buildings where there were families who were living there temporarily. And this passage has was just been on my mind for the last couple of weeks. And so I'm just thinking about the lesser known saints. And we went into this room where there was a few people who were just there serving these families. And they were just there at the, at the tables talking and laughing and, and trying to minister to them. And I thought, lesser known saints doing a ministry that nobody knows nothing about. Nobody knows anything about. But God sees and God watches and God hears and He sees and He blesses. They took us to another building. They call it the academy. It's where a lot of the classes take place. And they had on the bulletin board a number of the classes that were there and the people who taught it. And I began scanning it because I had taught in that building about 50 different times. And I began scanning the names. There was about 40 of them and I didn't know any of them. I thought, lesser known saints. We're the lesser known saints that God is using to bless and minister and serve other people. And God could be using you as well. And so the first one we're going to see here in verse 19 is Prisca and Aquila. Depending upon your translation or which translation you're reading from, yours might say Prisca or yours might say Priscilla. It would seem as though Prisca is kind of like um, an abbreviated name of Priscilla. This is a married couple, Prisca and Aquila. Prisca is in the feminine, Aquila is in the masculine. He is the, the husband. And this was a married couple that God used in tremendous ways. They were actually some people that, that served alongside the Apostle Paul at a lot of different points in his ministry. And Paul met this couple, this married couple in Corinth on his second missionary journey. They were Jewish people. They had to flee Italy when Emperor Claudius ordered all Jews to be expelled from Rome, as we saw in Acts chapter 18. And Paul stayed with them because this married couple were also tent makers like he was. They had a lot in common. When Paul left Corinth, he took Prisca and Aquila, this married couple with him, and then he sent them and left them in Ephesus to minister, minister to the people in Ephesus while he left. He gave them great responsibility. While in Ephesus, Prisca or Priscilla and Aquila met a certain man named Apollos. Apollos, the Bible actually says something interesting about, and yet we really don't know anything much more about him, but he was an Alexandrian by birth. The scripture says that he was an eloquent, eloquent man who was mighty in the scriptures. But the problem was that he had a very sort of incomplete, limited understanding of the gospel. And so it says that Priscilla and Aquila lovingly took him aside and, here it is, explained to him the way of God more accurately used in Apollos' life to explain the gospel of Jesus Christ a little bit more accurately. This man who was eloquent, mighty in the scriptures, was used as a preacher to the different churches. God brought in this married couple for a time to bless him and serve him so that he could understand more thoroughly the gospel. In Romans chapter 16, Paul, as he is writing, mentions these two people again. He says, Greet Prisca and Aquila. My fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risk their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles also greet the church that is in their house. They were also people who opened up their house, and that's where the church met. It's amazing how God can use the lesser known saints to bring him honor and glory. Here's another person, Onesiphorus. Try to say that fast five times. Onesiphorus. It actually refers to this man with another part, another phrase, the household of Onesiphorus. In fact, it's given to us two times in Scripture, and each time it refers to the household of Onesiphorus. And so it likely means that not only Onesiphorus was a believer, but everybody who was also in his house, that they served as a family for the glory of God and were involved in ministry. 
In 2 Timothy chapter 1, it says, The Lord grant mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he was in Rome, he eagerly searched for me and found me. The Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day, and you know very well what services he rendered at Ephesus. Faithful for a time, and yet mostly forgotten. The next person we come across is Erastus. Erastus. We don't know too much about Erastus except that he was a civil servant. It says in Romans 16, verse 23, it says, Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you. And that's it. Someone who served in civil government, who was also a believer, also praying for those who were serving. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you. Another name we see here is Trophimus. Trophimus was a native of the province of Asia, specifically of the city of Ephesus, and he accompanied Paul from place to place, even from Greece to Troas. But if you remember a time in which the apostle Paul was beaten up and the mob came and and they arrested him, well, it was because Paul was with Trophimus in the city. Trophimus was not a pure Jew, he was a Gentile, and they assumed that they had seen Trophimus with Paul in the temple, which would have been a no-no. In fact, the Romans allowed that if anybody defiled the temple, that they could be killed on the spot. And so this was a big thing they had misunderstood. It says in Acts chapter 21, verse 29, for they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. What is Trophimus mostly known for? Getting Paul incarcerated. And yet he was one who accompanied the Apostle Paul from place to place. Then we come across four different names. Eubulus, Pudens, Linus, Claudia. These four, we know absolutely nothing about. Their names aren't given to us anywhere else in Scripture. Eubulus, Pudens, Linus, Claudia. In fact, Claudia, a woman a faithful, obviously, friend of the Apostle Paul's. Church tradition tells us that, well, maybe she was the wife or the mother of Linus, one of those other names that are given to us, but that's pure speculation. She's likely just a woman who was serving alongside the Apostle Paul, being used in a great way to encourage him in the ministry, just like all the others. The last name, if you will, that is given to us in this passage is all the brethren. All the brethren greet you. No specific names, just just the people who are there in the church where he was at. Everyone else in the local church. Names aren't necessary. But they were the faithful ones who were eventually forgotten. And so that brings us then to the third point that I want to spend a little bit of time on. The lesser known saints. Lesser known saints. I actually thought about titling the message the 30 fold Christian. Remember the parable of the soils, where some had a hundred fold, some 60, and some 30? The 30 fold Christians. Very often, the lesser known saints are those who are used by God for a time, and then very often we know nothing about. Remember a guy named Onesimus? If you read the book of Philemon, you'll know about Onesimus. He was a slave. He was a slave that grew up in Philemon's household. The church actually met in Philemon's house, so he was an unsaved slave, a servant, who was in Philemon's house where the church met, and he saw the church all the time. He saw the people. He didn't want to be a slave anymore. He ran away. He took some things, he ran away, he went to Rome, he finds the Apostle Paul. Paul begins speaking to him. He gets saved. He gets saved. And Paul knows he has to go back. He has to go back to talk to Philemon. He goes back to Philemon's house, he's got the scroll in his hand. Paul says in verses 10 and 11 of Philemon, I I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. Onesimus, this former slave who Philemon set him free, he wasn't a Bible teacher. 
It doesn't say that he was an elder in any church. He wasn't a church planter. He was more of just a travel companion. Maybe even an an errand runner, if you want to put it that way. And yet used mightily by God. And it says even in Colossians chapter 4 verse 9, when Paul is speaking about some of the other people, he says, and with him Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number. They will inform you about the whole situation here. So he became a messenger. And used by God in amazing ways. How about a woman named Tabitha? Also called Dorcas. By the way, if anybody's going to have a baby, a girl, Tabitha is a great name. I wouldn't suggest Dorcas. Kind of a strange name. But Tabitha was an amazing person. You know what she was? You know what her job was? Her ministry? She was a seamstress. A seamstress. She eventually died, and God decided to use Peter to raise her from the dead. Not a preacher, not a, not a church planner, not a missionary, not an elder, not a Bible teacher, not somebody with, with great resources and financial wealth, but a woman who was used for many deeds inside the local church. God brought her back. In Acts chapter 9, verses 36 to 41, it says this. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. The woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. That's her ministry. She's a lesser known saint, and this was her ministry. Kindness. Deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. And it happened at that time that she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in the upper room. Since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, imploring him, do not delay in coming to us. So Peter arose and went with them. When he arrived, they brought him into the upper room. And all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. That was her thing. All the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. You know, I think about one of the ministries that's here at the church. Stitches for the Savior. There's people in there making making blankets. Putting together socks. People who are in in the closet bringing forth the clothes to bring to the people who are out in the community. That is an important ministry in the kingdom of heaven that God blesses it and he sees it. And Maybe God would have you be a part of that ministry too. Peter sent them out and knelt down and prayed and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter, she sat up and he gave her his hand and raised her up and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. Lesser known saints, faithful than forgotten. How about another one? Barsabbas. Not to be confused with Barabbas, who was let go instead of Jesus. This man's name was Barsabbas. And I bet if I was to ask most people around the church, who is Barsabbas, many probably wouldn't know. When Judas Iscariot committed suicide, one of the original 12 disciples... At the beginning of the book of Acts, they needed to replace him. And so they brought forth two people, Matthias and Barsabbas. And Barsabbas wasn't chosen. He was a man who was qualified. They began to cast lots, but Matthias was chosen instead of Barsabbas. And we never hear of Barsabbas again. Oh, he was a faithful man. He was qualified. He was in ministry. He he fulfilled the things that God had placed before him, but it wasn't God's will at that time for him. Acts chapter 1 verse 21 says, Therefore it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they put forward two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. 
And they prayed and said, You, Lord, you know the hearts of all men. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them. And the lot fell to Matthias. And he was added to the eleven apostles. We don't hear about Barsabbas anymore. But you know what? We also don't hear about Matthias anymore either. And if you actually go and study the original 12 apostles, many of them you will see nothing that they ever did in Scripture. You don't see any of their particular ministries. And a a large number of them, after the church is born in Acts chapter 2 in the day of Pentecost, their names are never mentioned again. Faithful then forgotten. Lesser known saints. How about Phoebe? You remember Phoebe? She was one of the first deaconesses in the church. She was a great and mighty servant of the Lord. She was used by the Apostle Paul in tremendous ways. It says about her in Romans chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church which is at Centria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you, for she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. You know, as I start thinking about the takeaways here, God will use anyone for his glory, whether they even be slaves or those born into the right family. God can turn weakness into power, and he can turn the sinful into obedient children of God. And the God of the Bible is the God of second chances. God sees you as useful, not useless. Faithfulness comes in all shapes, sizes, genders, and spiritual giftedness. And history may not remember your name, but God does. There was another that I wanted to take a look at, but we don't have time. His name is Mark, often referred to as John Mark. He was the one that God used to write the gospel of Mark. And as a, as a late teenager, potentially early 20s, When Barnabas and the Apostle Paul were set apart to go out, they chose Mark as their assistant to go with them. But as soon as the ministry got difficult, he left them. And he was gone for years. What if he just gave up and allowed that to be his reputation forever? No, he persisted. And God gave him another chance. And so as... I bring this message close to the end. Our final point here is that God knows your name. God knows your name. There are lots of people's names written in the book, written in the Bible. I mean, you can go and read the book of Numbers to see that there's a lot of names written in the Bible. But you don't remember what they did. And God knows those who are His, the great and the small. Listen to me, the great and the small. God knows those who are His. And what matters is, isn't so much if if their name was written in the Bible. It doesn't matter so much here. What matters is, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? After all is said and done, there are... There are hundreds, if not thousands of people whose names are written down in this book and they are not in heaven right now. There were lots of enemies listed here. There were lots of people who thought that they were of God's family but were not. What matters is your name written down in the Lamb's book of life. In fact, it's so important. It's actually spoken of a number of times in Scripture. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, it says that the Apostle Paul is talking about some women who have shared in his struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. In the book of Revelation chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Whoever overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, it says, And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. The great and the small standing before the throne, and books were open, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. Finally, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 27, 
and speaking about heaven and those that will actually come into it. It says, and nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so the question then is, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Because whatever else happens, that's all that's going to matter in the end. My friends, you might not think of yourself this way. But remember that theme? You are a supernatural, fruit-bearing child of God. So be the 30-fold church. Be the 60-fold church. Be the 100-fold church. Take your five talents. Take your two talents. Take whatever ministry God has for you and run with it. Run with it. Don't slow down. Because that's why we're here. That's why we're here. Lesser-known saints, every single one of us known by our Abba Father in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for glorious things that You are doing among Your people. We thank You, Father, for the power of Your Holy Spirit to work among us. We thank You that You have called us according to Your own purpose. That the worship that we offer to you, that the lifestyles that we live can be a sweet-smelling aroma of praise. And so, Father, I pray that you would bless everyone here this morning, every man, woman, and child, the children. Father, for those who are watching on the television, either now live or later, I pray, Father, every single person, all the eyes, the hearts, the minds, all those who are yours, Father, that you would continually use them, encourage them, Father. Give them boldness in all that they do. And, oh, Father, for those who don't know you, may you crush their spirit. Oh, Father, may they, may they understand that they are lost. Father, please... The enemy, the world, the devil is trying to make them blind and, and to deceive them. Pa Father, please remove the veil so that they might see, that they might see their wretchedness, that they might see their sin, that they might see it against the backdrop of your love and your grace and your mercy and your goodness and your compassion. And Father, may they surrender. May they trust in you. Father, may their names be found written in the Lamb's book of life. May you save them, O oh Father, according to your own kindness, your own purpose, your own righteousness. Father, do it for your own namesake. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in unrighteousness, but because of your mercy. We ask their precious God you would do that. And Lord, for those who are already your children, oh, Father, please encourage them. So many, Lord, even at this time, discouraged with so many things going on around them in life and marriage and family and work and society and culture, so many things coming against them, ministries that seem to have been put on pause have ended. Oh, Father, bring them back. Father, let them see. Let them pursue an open door. And Father, give them the talent in which to go ahead and serve those who need to be served. Father, open up the door of ministry. Use them, encourage them, equip them, Father, and do it for your glory, for the benefit of your church, so that your name might be lifted on high. We pray this, Father, in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. sing about our 
pardon or invitation to this wonderful salvation. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. Come on, say it out, say it. I see his wounds, his hands and feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Wherever you are, let's stand up together and say his body bound. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. He entered sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all Say together, say, Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our church, God has so many wonderful things planned for those who are faithful. Maybe not wonderful based upon your definition or mine, but according to His. Beautiful, wonderful, marvelous thing. 
things in ministry where God uses you to bless those who are around you. And you might not even see the fruit of it while you're here, but God is keeping track. He sees it all. And God has a plan for you. It's for you to be a supernatural, fruit-bearing child of God. That is His plan. Every single person's plan might be different, but that's His plan for you. A supernatural, fruit-bearing child of God. How would God have you fulfill that? What would God have you do? Who does God want you to serve? Our prayer is that you would find that person or those people and that you would minister to them. And throughout this week, be thinking about that. How God might utilize you and use you to be a blessing to others. My friends, that is what our purpose is here. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for your glory and your goodness. Thank you for your people and your church. Thank you that you are worthy to receive our praise. We love you and praise you and thank you in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. You dismissed as we continue to worship.